section thirty of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter fifteen the indian mutiny eighteen fifty six to eighteen fifty eight part two next to delhi lucknow was the most important centre of the mutiny it was indeed natural that the capital of oude should be the focus of unrest in march sir henry lawrence had been appointed resident he clearly foresaw the coming storm and did all he could to put lucknow in a condition of defence but the task was not easy he had seven hundred british soldiers under his command and sixteen thousand native troops on may thirtieth the storm burst five of the native regiments broke out set fire to the cantonments and murdered their officers under circumstances of exceptional treachery the outbreak at lucknow gave the signal for revolt to every station throughout the old kingdom of oude by the middle of june every regiment in the province was in a state of mutiny as soon as Kanpur surrendered the mutineers moved on lucknow on june thirtieth lawrence with a little force marched out to meet more than six thousand rebels at chinhat a few miles outside the city his native gunners cut the traces of their horses threw the guns into a ditch and lawrence was compelled to retreat with heavy loss he could no longer hold the city and on july first he withdrew his little garrison into the residency within the residency were now confined nine hundred and twenty seven englishmen soldiers and civilians seven hundred and sixty five native troops and one hundred and thirty women and children on july second the residency was invested and two days later the garrison suffered an irreparable loss lawrence being killed by a bursting shell the command devolved on brigadier ingles and for eighty-seven days he sustained the siege with unflinching courage and marvellous resource again and again the rebels assaulted the residency again and again the assaults were repelled all through the burning summer the sufferings of the besieged were intense cholera smallpox and fever wrought deadly havoc upon a garrison confined within a narrow space and weakened by lack of food and ceaseless toil again and again the garrison learnt that relief was at hand only to be disappointed but at last on september twenty fourth the news reached them that havelock had arrived ever since the recapture of Kanpur, havelock had been trying with a force miserably inadequate to cut his way through the rebels to lucknow so far however he had failed immediately on arriving in india sir colin campbell the new commander-in-chief promised him reinforcements but at the same time announced to havelock's bitter chagrin that the command should be given to sir james outram on september fifteenth outram joined havelock at Kanpur, but with a chivalry rare even in the annals of the most chivalrous service in the world he refused to supersede his comrade until the work for which he had so long and so splendidly laboured should have been accomplished the major-general outram in gratitude for and admiration of the brilliant deeds in arms achieved by general havelock and his gallant troops will cheerfully wave his rank on the occasion and will accompany the force to lucknow in his civil capacity as chief commissioner of oude tendering his military services to general havelock as a volunteer so ran the general order of september sixteenth three days later havelock commenced his march at the head of three thousand men barely sufficient but splendidly handled they won their way through and after two days continuous fighting on the outskirts of the city havelock joined hands with ingles on september twenty fifth but the relief had cost him seven hundred men including general neil he was not strong enough to bring out the garrison with safety and in his turn therefore havelock found himself besieged in the residency when sir colin campbell reached india in august to take over the supreme command the prospects for his countrymen looked black indeed delhi was untaken lucknow unrelieved 
Kanpur doubtfully held by Havelock. For two months, Campbell was busily employed in collecting men and transports and sending them to the front. He left Calcutta himself on October 27th and reached Kanpur on November 3rd. On the 9th, he set out for the relief of Lucknow. He attacked the city with 5,000 men on the 14th, and after a series of difficult but brilliant actions, he joined hands with Outram and Havelock on the 17th. By the 22nd, Campbell had withdrawn the garrison in safety, but the luster of a great military achievement was dimmed by the death in the palace of the Alamba of the gallant Havelock, November 24th. Leaving Outram to hold that strongly fortified post, Campbell then hurried back to Kanpur. He was only just in time to avert disaster. During his absence, a large body of mutineers from the Maratha state of Gwalior had joined hands with the forces led by two of the most formidable opponents we had ever to encounter in the mutiny war. The one was Tantia Topi, the brilliant lieutenant of Nana Sahib, the other was the Rani of Jansi, the Joan of Arc of the Hindu mutineers. The rebels attacked Kanpur in force, and General Wyndham, whom Sir Colin had left in command, was driven back into his entrenchments. Urgent messages were dispatched to the commander-in-chief. Impeded though he was by the sick and wounded rescued from Lucknow, the latter marched with all possible speed. On December 5th, he sent off the convoy to Allahabad, and on the 6th, he attacked the rebels in Kanpur and smote them hip and thigh. Kanpur was saved, and the mutineers flying before the vigorous pursuit of Sir Hope Grant were dispersed far and wide. Over Kanpur, as over Delhi, the British flag once more waved, never again to be lowered. But Lucknow was still untaken. The Governor-General urged the importance of retaking Lucknow with all possible speed, and thus dealing an effective blow at the growing disaffection in Oud. Sir Colin retorted that the remnant of the cold season was insufficient for so great a task, and proposed instead an expedition for the reduction of Rolhilkhand. On military grounds there was much to be said in favour of Sir Colin's view. Lord Canning, however, was unquestionably right in insisting that political considerations pointed to the paramount necessity of reasserting British authority in Oude. The commander-in-chief loyally gave way, and during the next three months the mutineers were gradually driven in upon Lucknow. John Bahadur, the loyal Prime Minister of Nepal, advanced from the north at the head of 9,000 Gurkhas. General Franks drove in the rebels from the east, while Sir Colin himself, at the head of the finest British army which had ever been seen in India, swept up the whole country to the south and west of the city. Rejoining Outram at the Alamba, he fought a series of severe engagements, and at last, on March 21, 1858, Lucknow finally surrendered. The recapture of Lucknow dealt a death blow to any hope of victory which might still be entertained by the mutineers, and it ought to have ended the war. That it failed to do so was due primarily to the apathy which allowed a huge body of mutineers to escape with their trusted leaders from Lucknow, and secondly, to the unfortunate effect produced upon the talukdars or chief landowners of Oud by the issue of Lord Canning's proclamation. The terms of this famous proclamation aroused acute controversy both in India and at home. Issued on the morrow of the recapture of Lucknow, it declared that all the chiefs, with six exceptions having been guilty of rebellion against the Queen, had forfeited all their proprietary rights, that if they made instant submission their lives and honour should be safe, provided that their hands were not stained with English blood murderously shed, but that for any further privileges they must throw themselves upon the justice and mercy of the British government. Intended by Canning as a conditional offer of clemency, it was interpreted in Oud as a decree of confiscation. Sir James Outram and John Lawrence, to say nothing of Lord Ellenborough, now president of the Board of Control, regarded the proclamation as a grave error. Lawrence would have offered an amnesty to all who had not been guilty of murder. 
no mutineer he wrote ever surrenders for directly he is caught he is shot or hanged the truth of his words were proved to the hilt during the next few months rohilkhand was reduced to submission by the end of may but not until january eighteen fifty nine was the last of the organized force of the rebels finally dispersed in oud and in oud alone did the mutiny assume something of the character of a national insurrection and there can be no question that this was due in large measure to the unfortunate terms of lord canning's proclamation the chiefs believed erroneously but not unnaturally that they had little to gain by submission and everything to fear consequently they waged for months a guerrilla war which caused infinite embarrassment to the british forces and their commanders and yielded them little credit while sir colin campbell was busy in rohilkhand bahar and oud sir hugh rose afterwards lord strathnairn was gradually reducing the central provinces to obedience that the trouble was virtually confined to these provinces and did not extend to the bombay presidency was due in the main to the firm and prudent statesmanship of the governor lord alphenstone and of george barclay seton carr the political officer in charge of the southern mahratta country the central provinces the fruit of dalhousie's doctrine of lapse were less amenable to control and their temper gave cause for much anxiety to the government on december sixteenth eighteen fifty seven sir hugh rose arrived at indore to take up his command and during the next six months he gradually reduced the central provinces john c was the centre of insurrection its leaders were tantia topi and the rani of john c outside john c sir hugh won a brilliant victory over tantia topi at betwa april first eighteen fifty eight two days later he captured john c itself the stronghold of the rani and on may twenty second the great fortress of Kalpi. The intrepid Rani then got possession of Gwalior and induced its inhabitants to proclaim the Nana Sahib as Peshwa. On June 17th, however, the Rani was killed at the head of her troops, and on the 19th, Gwalior was taken by Sir Hugh Rose. But as in Oud, so also in the central provinces, the capture of the fortresses was followed by a prolonged period of guerrilla warfare. For nine months, Tantia Topi successfully eluded the British pursuit, doubling backwards and forwards with baffling rapidity until at length, in April of 1859, he was betrayed to his pursuers and after due trial was executed, April 18, 1859. With Tantia Topi's capture and death, the long drawn tragedy ends. Before the sword was actually sheathed, a change of momentous consequence was announced to the peoples of india it was generally recognized that the rule of the company could not survive the mutiny pitt's dual system established as a makeshift in seventeen eighty four had worked unexpectedly well for nearly three-quarters of a century but the theory was illogical and the machinery was cumbrous the time had clearly come when the crown must assume direct and formal responsibility for the government of the great empire which had been gradually built up by the representatives of a commercial company accordingly a bill framed on a series of resolutions adopted by the house of commons was passed by both houses and received the royal assent on august second eighteen fifty eight under this act the powers and territories of the east india company were transferred to the queen and the actual administration of india was committed to a secretary of state assisted by the council of india this council to be carefully distinguished from that of the viceroy is no phantom board it has consisted from the first of fifteen members appointed by the secretary of state nine of them must have recently served and resided for ten years in india and all are paid the board meets weekly and controls in a large measure the action of the secretary of state the transference of authority effected by this act was formally announced to the peoples of india on november first eighteen fifty eight the terms of the proclamation were carefully revised by the queen 
who from first to last had taken the closest and keenest interest in the progress of events in india with the original draft of lord stanley who as president of the board of control became the first secretary of state she was far from satisfied she wrote therefore to lord derby asking him to write it himself in his excellent language bearing in mind that it is a female sovereign who speaks to more than one hundred million of eastern people on assuming the direct government over them after a bloody civil war giving them pledges which her future reign is to redeem and explaining the principles of her government such a document should breathe feelings of generosity benevolence and religious feeling pointing out the privileges which the indians will receive in being placed on an equality with the subjects of the british crown and the prosperity following in the train of civilization the queen's wishes were respected and with admirable results more particularly were her personal views revealed in the passage with reference to religion firmly relying said her majesty on the truth of christianity and acknowledging with gratitude the solace of religion we disclaim alike the right and the desire to impose our convictions on any of our subjects it is our royal will and pleasure that no one shall in any wise suffer for his opinions or be disquieted by reason of his religious faith or observance we will show to all alike the equal and impartial protection of the law and we do strictly charge and enjoin those who may be in authority under us that they abstain from all interference with the religious belief or worship of any of our subjects under pain of our highest displeasure it is our further will that so far as may be our subjects of whatever class or creed be fully and freely admitted to any offices the duties of which they may be qualified by their education abilities and integrity duly to discharge finally the queen declared that the aim of her government should be the benefit of all her subjects resident in india in their prosperity will be our strength in their contentment our security and in their gratitude our best reward the proclamation produced the happiest effect in india and the queen's pleasure is reflected in a letter to the viceroy december second eighteen fifty eight it is she writes a source of great satisfaction and pride to her to feel herself in direct communication with that enormous empire which is so bright a jewel of her crown and which she would wish to see happy contented and peaceful may the publication of her proclamation be the beginning of a new era and may it draw a veil over the sad and bloody past the queen's hope was realized the proclamation did inaugurate a new era the direct government of india by the british crown this fact was further emphasized by the state tour of the prince of wales october eighteen seventy five to april eighteen seventy six and still more by the queen's assumption of the new title of empress of india the latter step was severely criticized at the time but it is now generally recognized to have been both opportune and appropriate it gave great satisfaction to the aging monarch and it served to cement the bond between the queen empress and the princes and peoples of the indian empire to describe it as a piece of political charlatanry is merely to betray that lack of imaginative sympathy which cost us so dear at the time of the mutiny almost every other gift both of character and intellect had been bestowed in full measure upon lord dalhousie had this been added the mutiny might never have occurred had the obverse gifts been lacking to his lieutenants and his successor the mutiny might well have been more serious than it was for tragic as were many of its incidents and critical as were many of its moments the mutiny was suppressed with relative ease that this was so was due to many contributory causes primarily to the unruffled coolness and intrepid courage of lord canning himself to his promptitude in diverting to india the british reinforcements on their way to china and his refusal to give way to panic to the skill with which lord elphinstone restrained the restlessness of bombay 
to the combination of sternness and conciliation displayed by lawrence and his colleagues in the punjab to the loyalty of the ruling princes not one of whom espoused the cause of the mutineers and to that of several powerful ministers such as jang bahadur of nepal and salar jang of hyderabad to the splendid services rendered at more than one important juncture by captain peel and his naval brigade and not least to the heroic fortitude of thousands of individual englishmen known and unknown to fame there were other factors in the suppression of the mutiny to which allusion has incidentally been made of these perhaps the most important was the lack of national unity in india thanks to this the sepoy mutiny never developed except in oud and in a less degree in the central provinces into a national insurrection had it done so it could hardly have been quelled by the efforts however splendid and heroic of a handful of englishmen planted in the midst of a teeming population alien to themselves in tradition in race and in creed the most momentous result of the mutiny was to bring that teeming population for the first time into direct dependence upon the british crown End of section thirty Section 31 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16. Domestic Administration, 1858 to 1860, England and Italy, Part 1. For nearly a decade, from the reopening of the Eastern Question in 1852 to the suppression of the mutiny in 1858, the mind of the nation was concentrated upon affairs external to Great Britain. The Near East, the Middle East, and the Far East in turn demanded all but exclusive attention. It was not long before foreign policy was again the dominant interest. For a brief interlude, however, we must plunge into the vicissitudes of parties and recall the details of domestic administration. While Englishmen were still racked by anxiety as to the fate of their countrymen in India, they were called upon to face a financial crisis at home, which was sufficiently severe and might have been disastrous. It was due to causes which during the last century have periodically recurred and are now well ascertained a period of over trading and speculation is invariably followed by a cessation of demand a consequent contraction of credit and the failure of banks and commercial houses the crisis of eighteen fifty seven in great britain was due primarily to railway speculations in the united states the effects made themselves felt on this side early in october the bank of england in order to protect its gold reserve put up the rate of discount to eight per cent and later on to ten private firms refused to discount bills at all banks of high standing closed their doors the bank of liverpool the western bank of scotland and the city of glasgow bank being among the victims on the evening of november eleventh the government learnt that the reserve at the bank of england had fallen to one million four hundred thousand pounds that it had less than eight million pounds in bullion and that its liabilities exceeded eighteen million pounds on the twelfth therefore lord palmerston and the chancellor of the exchequer authorized the suspension of the bank charter act and gave the directors permission to issue notes to an amount not exceeding two million pounds in excess of their legal maximum this saved the situation on december third parliament met for the purpose of passing an act of indemnity lord palmerston's summary of the debate is characteristic george lewis and j russell made good speeches the others not having a clear idea conveyed none no serious opposition was offered to the bill of indemnity the government had done the right thing and had done it promptly they could not of course avert a considerable amount of commercial distress 
but they successfully allayed the incipient financial panic. As in 1847, the opponents of bank restriction used the opportunity to point the moral of their argument, but they once more failed to convince the nation. The necessity for occasional suspension in times of panic is no proof of the futility of the restriction under normal conditions. From the standpoint of economic theory, J. S. Mill's plea against the Bank Charter Act is unquestionably powerful, but it cannot stand against the advocacy of such practical experts as Lord Overstone and Sir Robert Peel. All serious danger was at an end when on February 4th Parliament reassembled for the regular session of 1858. Its first business was to vote an address of congratulation to the Queen on the marriage of the Princess Royal to Prince Frederick William of Prussia. The marriage, which had taken place at the Chapel Royal St. James on January 25th, was cordially approved by the nation, though the European position of an heir to the Prussian throne was not in 1858 what it is today. The affection manifested toward one who was looked upon as England's daughter, in Cobden's happy phrase, gave unfeigned pleasure to the Queen. A little later, Parliament voted its thanks to the statesmen and soldiers who had saved the situation in India. The Conservatives showed some disposition to resent the inclusion of Lord Canning's name, but fortunately for the reputation of the party, the point was not pressed. To Palmerston's India Bill, considerable opposition was offered, but the first reading was carried by a majority unexpectedly large, 145. The position of the government seemed unassailable, and it was generally believed that Lord Palmerston was installed in the premiership for life. Sir Richard Bethel, the Attorney General, remarked to the Premier as they left the House together after the division on the India Bill that he ought, like the Roman consuls, in a triumph to have somebody to remind him that as a minister he was mortal. Within a week, Lord Palmerston was beaten on what was virtually a vote of no confidence, and a few days later he resigned. Such is the irony of English politics. The circumstances which led to the sudden overthrow of a powerful minister require explanation. Felice Orsini was one of the many Italian exiles who found a temporary home in England. His lectures on Italian independence were received with enthusiasm by English audiences, and he imbibed the crazy notion that but for the emperor of the French, the English government would be disposed to give active assistance to the Italian cause. He determined, therefore, to remove the obstacle. On January 14th, Bombs were thrown at the emperor's carriage as he was driving with the empress to the opera. The emperor and empress were unhurt, but so severe was the explosion that ten people were killed and 156 were wounded. The news of the crime was received with horror and indignation in France and indeed throughout Europe. Orsini himself and one accomplice were executed. Two others were sent to penal servitude for life. But it was against England that the anger of the French people blazed out most fiercely. Orsini's conspiracy was hatched in England. Here the bombs were manufactured. Napoleon III and his empress had paid a friendly visit to the English court in the previous autumn, but Lord Palmerston's speech at the Lord Mayor's banquet, November 9, 1857, had been gratuitously provocative in tone, and he noted with curious satisfaction that he had aroused French susceptibilities. The Orsini conspiracy opened the floodgates of invective against England. The army demanded to be led against the den of assassins. They urged that the infamous haunt in which machinations so infernal are planned should be destroyed forever. 
Unfortunately, these foolish vaporings, and many like them, were published in the official Moniteur. Count Walewski, on behalf of the French government, expressed official regret and pleaded inadvertence. But in a dispatch, January 20th, he affirmed the unquestionable fact that the Orsini conspiracy was the third which had been hatched in England against the person of the French emperor, and propounded certain questions which could hardly under the circumstances be deemed impertinent. Ought the right of asylum to protect such a state of things? Is hospitality due to assassins? Ought English legislation to contribute to favor their designs and their plans? And can it continue to shelter persons who by their flagrant acts place themselves beyond the pale of common right and under the ban of humanity? He pointedly refrained from indicating the steps which the English government ought to take, but he expressed the opinion that France had a right to expect from an ally that the guarantees against the repetition of such outrages should be effectual. To this dispatch no official reply was made, though Lord Cowley was instructed to communicate the sentiments of the English cabinet to the French government. A more effective response was not long deferred. On February 8th, Lord Palmerston moved for leave to introduce a bill to amend the law in regard to conspiracy to murder. Hitherto it had been treated in England merely as a misdemeanor, in Ireland as a capital crime. He proposed to unify the law throughout the United Kingdom and to make conspiracy to murder a felony punishable with penal servitude. Mr. Kinglake moved as an amendment that it was inexpedient to legislate in compliance with the demand made in Count Balevsky's dispatch of January 20th until further information be obtained, but the amendment was withdrawn and leave to introduce the bill was given by 299 votes against 99. On February 19th, the second reading was moved by the Prime Minister, but it was immediately apparent that in the interval opinion had developed against the bill, or rather against the action or inaction of the government. In particular, they were severely criticized for not having replied in formal manner to Count Walewski's dispatch of January 20th. Mr. Milner Gibson moved as an amendment that this House hears with much concern that it is alleged that the recent attempt upon the life of the Emperor of the French has been devised in England and expresses its detestation of such guilty enterprises, and that while this House is ready at all times to assist in remedying any defects in the criminal law, which after due investigation are proved to exist, yet it cannot but regret that Her Majesty's government previously to inviting the House to amend the law of conspiracy at the present time have not felt it to be their duty to reply to the important dispatch received from the French government dated Paris, January 20th, 1858, which has been laid before Parliament. Mr. Gladstone and Mr. Disraeli both supported the amendment, and through a combination of radicals, Peelites, and Tories, the government was beaten by 234 votes to 215. Lord Palmerston at once resigned, and the Queen entrusted the formation of a ministry to Lord Derby. His first step was to invite Gladstone's cooperation, but the latter, after consultation with Graham, Sidney Herbert, and Lord Aberdeen, declined. Lord Grey also refused to join him. Once more, therefore, Derby was compelled to form a purely conservative cabinet and to take office in a minority. He did not relish the task, and it proved to be not less difficult of fulfillment than he anticipated. Eventually he was joined by eight of his late colleagues. His son, Lord Stanley, came into the cabinet as colonial secretary, General Jonathan Peel as war secretary. Mr. Thesiger, raised to the peerage as Lord Chelmsford, became Lord Chancellor in place of Lord St. Leonard's, and Lord Ellenborough went to the Board of Control. Footnote. The other principal ministers were Disraeli, Chancellor of the Exchequer, 
Lord Malmesbury, Foreign Secretary, Spencer Walpole, Home Secretary, and Sir J. Packington, Admiralty. End footnote. On March 12th, Disraeli, who again led the House of Commons, was able to announce that the painful misconceptions which had for a time subsisted between the French and English governments had entirely terminated in a spirit friendly and honourable, and in a manner which will be satisfactory to the feelings as it will be conducive to the interests and the happiness of both nations. Lord Malmesbury's answer to the famous dispatch of January 20th and Count Walewski's reply were alike admirable in tone, and the incident was thus happily closed. But it left behind it an uneasy feeling in both countries. This feeling found expression in England in the formation of a volunteer rifle corps and of a reserve volunteer force of seamen, 1859, and a year later in a special vote of two million pounds for the fortification of the dockyards. The fall of Lord Palmerston interrupted his schemes for the better government of India, but the matter once mooted could not be allowed to rest, and the incoming ministry proposed a measure known as India Bill No. 2. Framed on the same general principle as that of Lord Palmerston, it contained a fantastic and pseudo-democratic device for the election of the India Council. All parties mistrusted it, but all agreed that the transference of India from the company to the Crown must somehow be effected, and Lord John Russell therefore rescued the government from a difficulty by suggesting that the House should proceed by way of resolution. Disraeli eagerly assented, and resolutions were brought forward on which the bill already described was framed. Before the bill became law, August 3rd, and while the debates on the resolutions were in progress, the whole question was hung up by the controversy which arose between Lord Ellenborough, now President of the Board of Control, and the Governor-General. Lord Canning's out proclamation was a tempting opportunity for a man with Lord Ellenborough's turn for pompous phrasing and melodramatic effect. Lord Ellenborough was by no means alone in his disapprobation of the proclamation, and owing to an indiscretion on the part of Mr. Vernon Smith, his predecessor at the board, it reached him without the explanatory letter addressed by Lord Canning to the late President. Thereupon Lord Ellenborough, without consulting his colleagues and without taking the Queen's pleasure, addressed to Lord Canning a severe and scathing rebuke. However great Canning's mistake might have been, the terms employed by Lord Ellenborough admitted of no excuse. To make matters worse, he actually made public his dispatch. The government declared, through the mouth of Disraeli, that they disapproved of the policy of the proclamation in every sense. Many other people did the same. But Lord Ellenborough's treatment of a public servant placed in such a situation as that of Lord Canning was regarded by every fair-minded man as intolerable. To rate the Governor-General like a schoolboy was bad enough. To publish the lecture to the world was worse still. To save his colleagues from inevitable defeat, Lord Ellenborough resigned, May 13th. Lord Derby made great efforts to induce Mr. Gladstone to accept the vacant post. These efforts were warmly seconded by Disraeli, whose letter to his great rival remains a monument of ill-requited magnanimity. Gladstone again consulted his Peelite friends, but again declined Lord Derby's overtures. The vacant post was filled by Lord Stanley, whose place at the colonial office was taken by Sir E. Bulwer-Lytton. Lord Ellenborough, after a generous eulogium from his chief, disappeared from public life. Of him it may truly be said that nothing became him like the leaving of it. Everything that was possible to atone for his conduct he did. As for Lord Canning, he met the attack with his invariable calmness and courage. No taunts or sarcasms come from what quarter they may will turn me from the path which I believe to be that of my public duty. I believe that a change in the head of the government of India at this time 
if it took place under circumstances which indicated a repudiation on the part of the government in england of the policy which has hitherto been pursued toward the rebels avowed would seriously retard the pacification of the country firm in these convictions i will not in a time of unexampled difficulty danger and toil lay down of my own act the high trust which i have the honour to hold thus lord canning wrote to his masters in leadenhall street he was sustained in his resolution by expressions of sympathy from many quarters lord derby telegraphed an assurance of his personal confidence lord malmesbury wrote as a private friend but with the cordial assent of the queen urging him not to resign neither lord derby he wrote nor any of our party wish it and the whole country is ready to give you all the credit you merit for having so well encountered the extraordinary difficulties of your position the directors passed a special vote of confidence the queen lost no opportunity of expressing her disapproval of ellenborough's vanity and tactlessness and her undiminished and entire confidence in lord canning he was made an earl and received the g c b in eighteen fifty nine and the garter in eighteen sixty one in parliament the attack on the government was a complete failure in the lords lord shaftesbury's motion was lost by a majority of nine in the commons mr cardwell's motion was withdrawn and the attack unexpectedly collapsed the leader of the house described the scene to the queen with evident but decorous glee to the electors of slough he was less restrained he compared the collapse of the opposition to an earthquake in calabria or peru there was he said a rumbling murmur a groan a shriek a sound of distant thunder no one knew whether it came from the top or the bottom of the house there was a rent a fissure in the ground and then a village disappeared then a tall tower toppled down and the whole of the opposition benches became one great dissolving view of anarchy the new government had survived not without an element of luck its first great peril and for twelve months more despite the heterogeneous majority opposed to it went on its way rejoicing over and over again during the last quarter of a century had the house of commons attempted to induce the lords to assent to the admission of jews to parliament at last in eighteen fifty eight their persistence had its reward once again the lower house passed a bill proposed to it by lord john russell to alter the oaths of allegiance and supremacy and to relieve jews from the necessity of affirming on the true faith of a christian once more the lords refused to make the concession to the jews the commons insisted and a deadlock seemed imminent when lord lucan proposed that either house should be empowered to modify by its own resolution the form of oath to be taken by its members this ingenious compromise was accepted and a bill to give effect to it was passed together with russell's oaths bill by both houses in the commons a resolution was carried to enable jews to omit the words objectionable to them and baron rothschild who had been periodically elected by the city of london since eighteen forty seven was at last permitted to take his seat july twenty sixth the same session witnessed also the abolition of the property qualification of members this modest instalment of the chartist programme must be credited to mr locke king a persistent reformer who tried also to effect an extension of the county franchise he failed not for the first time in his immediate purpose but in the following session the conservative party under the inspiration of their brilliant leader in the house of commons tackled this thorny question the year eighteen fifty nine opened with a renewed agitation for parliamentary reform led by mr bright disraeli anxious to prove that the liberals had no monopoly in the subject produced his reform bill on february twenty eighth the new bill was based upon the principle of representing not merely property and population but interests this house declared disraeli ought to represent 
all the interests of the country. After all, the suffrage and the seat are only means to an end. They are means by which you may create a representative assembly that is a mirror of the mind as well as of the material interests of England. You want in this house every element that obtains the respect and engages the interest of the country. The central feature of the bill was an attempt to realize this conception. It contained a small dose of redistribution. Fifteen relatively unimportant boroughs were to lose one member apiece. Eight towns were enfranchised. Four additional members were given to the West Riding, two to South Lancashire, and two to Middlesex. There were to be increased facilities for polling, but the most interesting and the most distinctive proposals were those connected with the franchise. The county franchise was to be assimilated to that of the boroughs, the borough freeholders were to be deprived of their county vote, and a large number of new qualifications were created. A vote was to be given to university graduates, ministers of religion, lawyers, medical men, certain schoolmasters, and every one who had sixty pounds in a savings bank, who had a naval, military, or civil pension of twenty pounds a year, or who drew ten pounds a year from the funds, bank stock, or East India stock. It was these fancy franchises, as they were derisively termed, which ultimately killed the bill, but meanwhile opposition developed in many quarters. Two members of the cabinet, Mr. Walpole and Mr. Henley, refused to be responsible for its introduction and resigned office. That they reflected the mind of the Conservative Party much more faithfully than its brilliant chief cannot be doubted. In particular, they disliked the disfranchisement of the freeholders, an objection which they shared with Mr. Bright and Lord John Russell. The two latter also complained with Roebuck that nothing was done for the working classes. Nevertheless, the reception accorded to the bill was not unfriendly, and it was defeated on second reading only by a majority of 39, 330 to 291. The government thereupon decided to appeal to the constituencies, and after some necessary business was dispatched, Parliament was prorogued, April 19th, with a view to immediate dissolution. The general election which ensued turned less upon reform than upon foreign affairs. The Italian war had broken out, and the Conservatives were suspected of some leanings toward the Austrian cause, perhaps with justice. At any rate, their neutrality was less benevolent toward Italy than that of their opponents. They gained twenty to thirty seats, but this was not sufficient to give them a majority, and on an amendment to the address moved by Lord Hartington, they were defeated in a full house by thirteen, three hundred and twenty-three to three hundred and ten. End of section thirty-one. Section thirty two of England since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter sixteen Domestic Administration, eighteen fifty eight to eighteen sixty England and Italy, part two. Lord Derby immediately resigned, and the Queen anxious to avoid the invidious task of deciding between the claims of two statesmen so full of years and honours as lord palmerston and lord john russell sent for lord granville the two veterans had previously agreed to co-operate with each other whichever of the two might be called upon to form a ministry that the queen might select a third person had not entered into their calculations neither liked the solution but palmerston always good-natured and complacent agreed to serve under lord granville provided the latter could form a really strong cabinet lord john however refused to occupy the third place in the ministry and the negotiations to the queen's regret broke down the queen then sent for lord palmerston lord john would have liked his rival to go to the House of Lords and leave him the lead of the Commons. Failing that, he now agreed to serve under him, provided he might have the Foreign Office. This demand, though not intrinsically unreasonable, 
had the unfortunate result of excluding from the cabinet the soundest and safest of living diplomatists lord clarendon lord john's terms were accepted and palmerston was able to form a government of unquestionable individual strength lord granville the duke of argyle sir charles wood and mr gladstone returned to the posts they had previously held sir george grey temporarily displaced at the home office by sir g c lewis accepted the chancellorship of the duchy of lancaster lord campbell became lord chancellor and the duke of somerset took the admiralty cobden was pressed to take the board of trade and on his refusal it was given to milner gibson but of the new appointments incomparably the most important was that of lord john russell to the foreign office rarely has the interest in foreign affairs been more absorbing than during the second palmerston ministry the war of italian liberation the relations between england and napoleon the third a new war in china in eighteen sixty the civil war in america raising delicate diplomatic questions for great britain and resulting in one of the severest commercial crises through which we have ever passed finally the fateful struggle for the danish duchies upon these matters the attention of the country was for the next six years necessarily concentrated on january first eighteen fifty nine napoleon the third startled the diplomatic world by an ominous speech to the austrian ambassador in paris i regret that the relations between our two countries are so unsatisfactory the echo came ten days later from turin the situation said victor emmanuel in opening the piedmontese parliament is not free from peril for while we respect treaties we cannot be insensible to the cry of anguish which comes to us from many parts of italy there was no mistaking the significance of either speech nor any doubt as to the source of their inspiration cavour as we have said had gone away from the congress of paris a happy man what can i do for italy napoleon had asked cavour told him and the pact drafted at paris was sealed at plombieres eighteen fifty eight austria was to be expelled from the peninsula and northern and central italy were to be united under the house of savoy in return france was to get savoy and perhaps nice also queen victoria was much exercised by the prospect of war and did her utmost to maintain peace she personally addressed the emperor of austria and sent lord cowley on a mediatorial mission to vienna but to no purpose france refused the proffered mediation of england and austria accepted it only under the condition of the disarmament of sardinia on april twenty third austria demanded hastily and precipitately that disarmament cavour gleefully accepted the challenge and the austrian troops crossed the Ticino the emperor of the french promptly fulfilled his engagement on may thirteenth victor emmanuel met at genoa the magnanimous ally who had come at the head of a magnificent army to liberate italy from the alps to the adriatic a brief but brilliant campaign in north italy was suddenly arrested to the chagrin of sardinia and the astonishment of europe by the armistice of villa franca on july eighth napoleon came to terms with the emperor francis joseph italy was to be free not to the adriatic but only to the mincio austria was to retain venetia and the quadrilateral leopold of tuscany and francis of modena were to be restored to their ducal thrones but without recourse to force piedmont was to annex lombardy and italy was to be federated under the presidency of the pope neither napoleon's reasons for proposing nor those of austria for accepting the armistice concern the argument of this chapter both were largely influenced by the mobilization of prussia the gist of the thing is wrote Mulke, that austria would rather give up lombardy than see prussia at the head of germany 
there can be no doubt that napoleon preferred to leave his italian mission half accomplished rather than see a prussian army on the rhine as a matter of fact he had done more for italy than he knew perhaps more even than he meant in eighteen sixty tuscany parma modena and the northern half of the papal states were united by plebiscite to sardinia and on april second eighteen sixty a parliament representing eleven million italian people met for the first time at turin this result was achieved partly by the pluck and pertinacity of victor emmanuel still more by the singularly adroit diplomacy of cavour but not least by the cordial sympathy and goodwill of the liberal ministry in england that ministry contained at least three men who were wholeheartedly devoted to the italian cause lord john russell mr gladstone and lord palmerston himself during the months which followed upon the armistice of villafranca the position was intensely critical it soon became clear that the duchies of central italy were irrevocably determined upon union with sardinia this placed napoleon in a difficult position both as regards austria and italy and he wished to thrust upon great britain the responsibility of proposing a revision of the terms agreed upon at villafranca england's position was not free from embarrassment the court was increasingly suspicious of the designs of napoleon and most anxious not to throw the weight of england into the scale against austria lord palmerston on the contrary stood where he had stood in eighteen forty eight and eighteen forty nine i am very austrian north of the alps but very anti-austrian south of the alps the austrians have no business in italy and they are a public nuisance there gladstone and russell entirely shared his views but the cabinet thought that these ministers were inclined to meddle too much in italian affairs again and again the queen was compelled to appeal to the cabinet against the prime minister and the foreign secretary and not infrequently with success johnny has had a lesson wrote lord granville to the duke of argyle that the cabinet will support the queen in preventing him and pam acting on important occasions without the advice of their colleagues in the end however it was the view of palmerston and russell which prevailed they insisted that the italians must be left to settle their own affairs for themselves the people of the duchies wrote palmerston have as good a right to change their rulers as the people of england france belgium and sweden and the annexation of the duchies would be an unmixed good for italy for france and for europe the duchies expressed their will unmistakably and europe acquiesced but if sardinia was to be enlarged by the acquisition of central italy the emperor napoleon must have his quid pro quo savoy and nice was the price demanded and paid still further shocks were in store for the apostle of legitimacy as long ago as eighteen fifty one mr gladstone had exposed the scandals of bourbon rule in southern italy early in eighteen sixty the great freelance giuseppe garibaldi the hero of the defence of rome in eighteen forty eight learnt that the standard of revolt had been raised by the sicilians and resolved to go to their assistance cavour did all he could to aid him so far as the diplomatic proprieties permitted there was naturally much fluttering in the diplomatic dovecotes when it was known that garibaldi and his thousand had sailed from genoa before europe had recovered from the first shock of surprise garibaldi had made himself master of sicily had crossed to the mainland and was on his way to naples the bourbon king fled from his capital on september sixth and on the seventh garibaldi entered it six weeks of intense anxiety ensued would garibaldi insist on the perpetuation of the dictatorship he had perforce assumed would he consent to the annexation of the two sicilies to the new kingdom of north italy would he defy catholic europe and march on rome garibaldi declared that he would not annex his recent conquests to the italian kingdom unless he could proclaim victor emmanuel 
king of Italy in Rome itself. The moment was intensely critical for the future of Italy, but Cavour was equal to the crisis. Go to Naples was Palmerston's advice to Cavour. To Naples Cavour went. Luckily for Italy, the king of Naples held the Garibaldians in check for a fortnight on the Volturno. Before Garibaldi had scattered the Neapolitans, October 1st, Victor Emmanuel and the Sardinian troops had marched south, and on November 7th, Garibaldi and his king rode into Naples side by side. Naples and Sicily declared by plebiscite for annexation, Garibaldi assented. On February 18th, 1861, a parliament for the first time representative of the whole of Italy save Rome and Venice assembled at Turin. Italy was all but made. At this supreme crisis of her fate, the support of England was of inestimable value to Italy. Napoleon would gladly have stopped Garibaldi if England would have joined him in the task. England refused to do so. Palmerston and Russell had always been warm friends to the cause of Italian liberty. They were now converts to the idea of Italian unity. They had become convinced that the only manner in which the Italians could secure their independence of foreign control was by forming one strong government for the whole of Italy. Her Majesty's government, wrote Russell, instead of joining in the censure pronounced by the powers against Victor Emmanuel, will turn their eyes rather to the gratifying prospect of a people building up the edifice of their liberties and consolidating the work of their independence. Russell's famous dispatch caused much heartburning among the chancelleries and courts, not excluding our own, of Europe. Ce n'est pas de la diplomatie, said Baron Bruno, c'est de la polissonnerie. At any rate, it made it clear that Great Britain would brook no outside interference with the development of internal affairs in Italy. In this sense, it was highly effective nor have the Italians been slow to recognize the debt which they owe to British diplomacy. Lord Palmerston and Lord John Russell are enshrined, and justly, alongside Victor Emmanuel and Cavour, Mazzini and Garibaldi, among the makers of Italian unity. The mistrust of Napoleon III, inspired by his Italian policy in 1859, was deepened by the events of 1860 and 1861, nor was it really allayed either by the conclusion of the Cobden Treaty or by the cooperation of the two countries in China. The absorption of Nice and Savoy by France was resented in England, and the more so when Palmerston failed to secure from Napoleon some consideration for the rights and susceptibilities of the Swiss Confederation, closely affected by the cession of Savoy. Rumors, not groundless, that the annexation of Savoy and Nice was to be complemented by that of Genoa or Sardinia, and perhaps Geneva as well, served still further to increase English suspicions of France. A French expedition to the coast of Syria, 1860 to 1861, on behalf of the Maronites, tended in the same direction. The emperor's mind, wrote Palmerston, seems as full of schemes as a warren is full of rabbits, and like rabbits, his schemes go to ground for the moment to avoid notice or antagonism. With such a restless neighbor, no country could afford to be unprepared for contingencies. Palmerston held firmly to the maxim, Si vis pacem parabellum. The naval estimates accordingly rose from about nine million pounds in 1859 to nearly twelve million pounds in 1860. An additional million and a half was taken for the army, 14 million pounds, instead of 12 million 500,000 pounds. 180,000 men were enrolled in the new volunteer force, and an expenditure of 9 million pounds was authorized on the fortifications of Portsmouth, Plymouth, Chatham, and Cork. The last item nearly cost Palmerston his Chancellor of the Exchequer but better lose Mr. Gladstone, as he wrote to the Queen, than run the risk of losing Portsmouth and Plymouth. And the former risk was really more remote, for Lord Palmerston's desk was said to be nearly full before 1865 of Mr. Gladstone's resignations. 
as to the danger of attack from france palmerston was becoming increasingly apprehensive of late he wrote to lord john i have begun to feel great distrust and to suspect that his formally declared intention of avenging waterloo has only lain dormant and has not died away this feeling was largely responsible for palmerston's refusal to encourage the scheme of m lesseps for the construction of a canal through the isthmus of suez he saw in it a great naval and military advantage to france in a war with england december eighth eighteen sixty one the cooperation of the two countries in the far east did not allay suspicion the chinese government refused to ratify the conditions accepted in the treaty of tien sen eighteen fifty eight and consequently it was found necessary to dispatch a considerable force under sir hope grant and general montauban the chinese treated the european envoys with treachery and brutality and not until severe fighting had taken place and the summer palace of peking had been sacked did the chinese give way the convention of peking was signed on october twenty fourth eighteen sixty the treaty of tiencen was ratified the indemnity imposed by it was doubled and the port of tiencen was open to british trade thus was the disagreeable task of lord elgin and baron gros at last accomplished a similar difficulty was encountered two years later in japan in eighteen sixty two the murder of mr richardson a member of the british agency established at yokohama compelled the english government to extract by force the payment of an indemnity the guilty parties after a brief struggle gave way and certain japanese ports were reopened to british trade in january eighteen sixty a notable victory was won for the principle of free exchange by the conclusion of the cobden treaty between england and france in the autumn of eighteen fifty nine cobden was deeply concerned at the increasing mistrust between the two governments and volunteered to try to negotiate a commercial treaty gladstone warmly approved the project and after some months of direct negotiation between cobden and the emperor the treaty was concluded january twenty third eighteen sixty france agreed to substitute a moderate tariff for virtual prohibition gradually the duty was to be reduced on british coal iron steel tools machinery and all the staples of british manufacture yarns flax hemp hair wool silk cotton skins wood glass and earthenware on none of these articles was the duty to exceed thirty per cent england engaged to sweep away all duties on manufactured goods and to reduce the duties on wine and brandy but the concessions were not limited to the contracting countries they were to apply to all nations alike our treaty with france said mr gladstone was in fact a treaty with the world and wide are the consequences which engagements of this kind carry in their train in view of this fact clearly insisted upon by the authors of the treaty it is grotesque to describe it as a departure from the principles for which cobden had always stood but excellent as were the commercial effects of his intervention it did little to improve the international outlook the energies of napoleon the third were however temporarily diverted to the other side of the atlantic in eighteen sixty one benito juarez the republican leader in mexico overthrew miramon who represented the clericals and monarchists miramon appealed for help to the great catholic powers in europe and in this appeal napoleon's vivid and fantastic imagination saw an opportunity for killing several birds with one stone he determined to place upon the throne of mexico the archduke maximilian brother of the emperor francis joseph of austria his candidate was well chosen maximilian was not only the brother of the emperor of austria but the son-in-law of king leopold of belgium and had won personal reputation as the governor of lombardy and venetia his promotion might therefore be expected to gratify the french clericals and the powerful family interests of Habsburgs, Orléans, and Saxe Coburg. Moreover, Juarez gave Napoleon a legitimate pretext for interference 
by the repudiation of the Mexican debt. England and Spain agreed to join France in enforcing payment and in protecting the persons and properties of their subjects in Mexico. To the demand of the three powers, backed up by imposing force, Juarez quickly assented. England and Spain therefore withdrew. Napoleon, whose ulterior designs had not been revealed to his confederates, did not. Alone he embarked on an enterprise destined to culminate in a terrible tragedy, to cheat all his hopes, and to react disastrously upon his position in France. End of section 32section thirty three of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter seventeen the rule of lord palmerston the civil war in america the danish duchies the close of an epoch eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five part one such contemporary success as napoleon attained in mexico would not have been possible but for the preoccupation of the united states in the autumn of eighteen sixty the states were in the throes of a presidential election that contest was the most momentous in their history for it resulted in the election of abraham lincoln Lincoln had leapt into fame in 1858 as the opponent of Douglas in the senatorial election for the state of Illinois. Douglas was successful, but two years later the tables were turned and Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States. In the first speech of his senatorial campaign, Lincoln had said, A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the House to fall. But I do expect that it will cease to be divided. It will become all the one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and will place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction or its advocates will push it forward until it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Lincoln was no root and branch abolitionist, but the election of this western attorney to the presidency was taken by the slave states as a menace to the institution by which they stood. In February 1861, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, following the lead of South Carolina, formally seceded from the Union, organized a government known as the Confederate States of America, drafted a constitution, and elected as their first president Jefferson Davis. It is difficult to deny the constitutional right of the Southern states to withdraw from a federal union formed as a contract between sovereign states it is not less difficult to deny that but for the supposed menace to the institution of slavery this right would not have been exercised least of all can it be doubted that secession was a tactical blunder on the part of the south slavery would have been safer inside than outside the union but the hot blood of the south was up on March 4, 1861, Lincoln entered upon the high office to which he had been elected in November, and at once announced that he had neither the will nor the power to abolish slavery, but that no secession could be permitted. The Confederates seized federal forts and arsenals, the first shot being fired against Fort Sumter at Charleston, April 12, 1861. Lincoln then called for 75,000 volunteers and declared the seceding states to be under blockade. The great civil war had begun. The varying fortunes of that war during the next four years, 1861 to 1865, cannot be followed in these pages, except in so far as they react upon England and English policy. 
the British government at once, May 8th, recognized the Confederate States as belligerents and issued, May 13th, the usual proclamation of neutrality. The recognition of belligerency was bitterly resented by the partisans of the North, but unreasonably, since it was logically necessitated by the proclamation of a blockade. Nevertheless, it was accepted as proof positive that English sympathies were with the South. As a fact, opinion was divided. The government maintained throughout a strict neutrality. Lord Russell, it is true, committed one bad blunder for which this country afterwards paid dearly, but the official attitude was not merely correct but dignified and calm. Nevertheless, the North had some ground for regarding England as a partisan of the South. Society, in the narrower sense, was all for the gentlemen of the cotton states against the commercial Yankees. The more influential organs of public opinion tended in the same direction. Palmerston, Russell, and Gladstone all said or did things which seemed to indicate similar sympathies, and would have done more had they not been restrained by a majority of their cabinet colleagues. The Duke of Argyle and Lord Stanley, Cobden and Bright, were on the contrary in favour of the North, and the working classes, despite the terrible sufferings inflicted on many of them by the conflict, were on the same side. The war had been in progress about seven months when an incident occurred which nearly brought Great Britain into the actual arena of conflict. The Confederate States were anxious to secure recognition from England and France. To that end, they dispatched two envoys, Mason and Slidell, to represent them officially, if it might be, in London and Paris, respectively. The envoys successfully pierced the blockade and at Havana, a neutral port, took ship in an English mail steamer, the Trent. On November 8, 1861, the San Jacinto, a federal ship of war commanded by Captain Wilkes, intercepted the Trent on the high seas, fired a shot across her bows, and demanded the surrender of Mason and Slidell, who, with their secretaries, were carried off in custody to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. The conduct of Captain Wilkes was beyond all question a flagrant violation of international law and aroused the liveliest indignation in Great Britain. A reinforcement of 8,000 troops was immediately sent to Canada, and Lord Lyons, the British ambassador at Washington, was instructed to demand the instant surrender of the prisoners and an apology for the insult to the British flag. The dispatch containing these instructions was sent to Windsor for the Queen's approval on November 30, 1861. The Prince Consort was gravely perturbed at the possibility of war and saw clearly that Russell's diplomatic methods were only too likely to provoke it. No one could doubt that the federal government was in the wrong, but the highest function of diplomacy, as the Prince conceived it, is to build a golden bridge for discomfited opponents. Prince Albert, from his deathbed, built it. The dispatch was remodeled, precisely on the line suggested by him, and a way of honorable retreat from a false position was offered to President Lincoln. Would he seize the opportunity? For a month there was tense anxiety in England, and indeed throughout Europe. The friendly offices of France and Russia at this juncture ought never to be forgotten. Both powers warned the American government that peace could be preserved only by prompt surrender. Mr. Thurlow Weed, an intimate friend of the Federal Secretary of State and then resident in London as his authorized but unofficial representative, warned Mr. Seward that feelings in England were deeply stirred and urged him to yield to the British demands absolutely and immediately. If Prince Albert built the bridge, the tact of Lord Lyons induced the American government to use it. On Christmas Day, 1861, 
President Lincoln agreed to hand over the prisoners to the British government, and on January 9, 1862, the good news reached England that Lincoln had disavowed the action of Captain Wilkes and that the immediate crisis was at an end. The Queen justly claimed this happy issue as a triumph for her beloved Prince. But the Prince himself did not live to see it. On December 14, 1861, he succumbed to an attack of gastric fever complicated by congestion of the lungs. The grief of the whole nation was profound. That of the Queen was indescribable. Those who were brought nearest to the Queen knew best what she and the country had lost, and the country came to know it too. At last the Queen's husband was known for what he was, at last his worth was recognized. All narrow jealousies are silent, and we see him as he moved. How modest, kindly, all accomplished, wise, with what sublime repression of himself, and in what limits, and how tenderly. The war cloud between England and the northern states passed. Between north and south there was no cessation of conflict. In England there was a superstition that the shopkeepers of the North could never beat the gentlemen of the South, and for a time it seemed to be justified. As in our own civil war, the first advantage lay with the aristocratic party. The North could produce for a while no general fit to cope with Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, and the South had the advantage of strategical position. If they stood where they were, they won. The North could only win by crushing their resistance and capturing their capital. But though the initial advantages were with the South, the odds were terribly against them. The North had the money, the men, and the machinery of government. Nevertheless, the dejection in their ranks was great as the second year of strife wore on without bringing them any nearer their main objective. The Confederate States, meanwhile, were desperately anxious to secure from the leading neutral a recognition of their independence, and in the autumn of 1862 they were within reasonable distance of getting it from France and England, if not from Russia. Napoleon III would gladly have conceded it, and Palmerston and Russell had got as far, September 1862, as to be willing to offer mediation. If mediation were refused by the North, the independence of the South was to be recognized. On October 7th, a third member of the government, Mr. Gladstone, made a memorable speech at Newcastle. We may have our own opinions about slavery, we may be for or against the South, but there is no doubt that Jefferson Davis and other leaders of the South have made an army, they are making, it appears, a navy, and they have made what is more than either, they have made a nation. The sensation produced by these words was, says Lord Morley, immediate and profound. Footnote. Life of Gladstone, volume 2, page 79. It is fair to say that the words were bitterly repented of. End footnote. They were taken to portend immediate recognition of Southern independence. Mainly, however, through the influence of Lord Granville, the cabinet decided against an offer of mediation. Nevertheless, the North had cause of offense against them. The South were making desperate efforts to repair the lack of a navy. They continued by various devices to acquire a small fleet of armed cruisers, which inflicted immediate damage on the merchant shipping of the North. Several of these cruisers were built in English yards. The most famous and the most destructive of them, the Alabama, was built by the famous firm of Laird at Birkenhead. More than once before she left the docks, Mr. Adams, the American minister in London, warned Russell as to the real destination of the vessel and begged him to stop her. Partly owing to his characteristic pedantry, partly to a series of accidents, Russell's intervention came too late, and the Alabama was let loose to prey upon American commerce. Russell's blunder cost this country over three million pounds sterling, and not a little humiliation. 
on the american continent meanwhile things were beginning to march to their appointed end not hastily and perhaps not willingly lincoln at last took the decisive step on september twenty third eighteen sixty two he issued a proclamation that in all states which should not by january first eighteen sixty three have returned to their allegiance to the union the slaves should be at once and forever free at last the true significance of the contest was clearly and unmistakably revealed lincoln himself was primarily and preeminently a unionist my paramount object he wrote is to save the union and not either to save or destroy slavery the fortunes of war converted him into an abolitionist from january first eighteen sixty three the cause of the union was identified with the cause of human liberty in eighteen sixty four the champion of both causes was re-elected president of the united states on april fourth eighteen sixty five the confederate government evacuated richmond on the ninth lee surrendered to general grant at appomattox the civil war was at an end in less than a week after lee's surrender lincoln was assassinated at washington april fourteenth eighteen sixty five into the actual vortex of the struggle england as we have seen had been nearly engulfed some of its worst consequences she did not escape in the year eighteen sixty and eighteen sixty one the lancashire cotton trade was unusually active and prosperous wages were high profits good the supply of raw material was abundant in the summer of eighteen sixty one lincoln declared the blockade of the southern ports and for the next four years the prosperity of lancashire was blasted the lancashire mills then as now were almost wholly dependent for the raw material of their staple industry upon the plantations of the southern states of america in eighteen sixty one the supply was suddenly cut off within a few weeks thousands of spinners and manufacturers were thrown out of work savings were quickly exhausted and by christmas eighteen sixty one signs of distress were manifest in many towns the calamity was faced by lancashire with a quiet courage that evoked the sympathy and admiration of the world early in eighteen sixty two a central relief committee was established in manchester under the presidency of lord derby with sir james k shuttleworth as vice-president in every town and village in lancashire sub-committees were established and the lord mayor opened a fund in london subscriptions poured in from all parts of england from india the colonies and from many foreign countries even the united states in the stress of their own difficulties did their best to assuage the sufferings for which they were directly responsible the lord mayor ultimately collected over five hundred thousand pounds sterling and from other sources more than two million pounds in money and kind was subscribed it is safe to say that no great charitable fund was ever established with such economy and wisdom all classes in lancashire and the adjacent counties gave freely of their time and energy both to minimize immediate sufferings and to prevent permanent demoralization while the behavior of the operatives themselves was admittedly exemplary in eighteen sixty two cobden estimated the loss to them in wages of seven million pounds per annum but there was hardly any crime and marvellously little imposition moreover all through the famine the working men never wavered in their devotion to the north they believed the union to be fighting in the cause of righteousness and freedom and to that cause they steadfastly adhered in eighteen sixty three the worst was over a certain amount of cotton was smuggled by the blockade runners through the northern fleets more was procured from egypt and other formerly undeveloped markets but not until eighteen sixty six did lancashire get back to normal conditions the american civil war with all its attendant anxieties for neutrals was still unfinished when the english ministry was confronted with difficulties in northern and eastern europe 
for a full century poland had supplied a fruitful soil for the cultivation of international rivalries the diplomatists imagined that the problem had been solved somewhat roughly in eighteen fifteen but the insurrections of eighteen thirty and eighteen sixty three proved that the hope was vain the latter rising was due to the seizure of two thousand men the flower of polish manhood as conscripts for the russian army the incident was described by the british ambassador at st petersburg as simply a plan by a clean sweep of the revolutionary youth of poland to kidnap the opposition and to carry it off to siberia or the caucasus the action of the russian viceroy in poland had singularly far-reaching results bismarck who had lately come into power utilized the situation with consummate but cold-blooded adroitness to conciliate the goodwill of russia he offered a free passage through prussian territory to russian troops and refused an asylum to polish refugees apart from his anxiety to gain the favour of the czar he could not afford to dally with revolution in poland his position is made clear in the following extract from a letter from king leopold to queen victoria if a poland such as the garibaldians wish could be restored it would be in close alliance with france and prussia particularly between the french on the rhine and a french province on the vistula could not exist king leopold's diagnosis of the situation though coloured by german sympathies was not inaccurate napoleon the third would gladly have done anything in his power to follow the traditional policy of france but his power was for the moment limited by preoccupation in mexico palmerston and russell were as usual all in favour of oppressed nationalities and anxious to give every kind of moral support to their aspirations russell addressed to the government of the czar a characteristic homily on the sanctity of the treaties of eighteen fifteen and the healing virtues of constitutional liberty the czar in reply politely told him to mind his own business and the poles were left to their fate the whole incident has a significance quite apart from poland it exhibited the foreign policy of the whigs in its worst and weakest aspect a priggish and hectoring tone combined with an unreadiness to employ force in support of convictions it secured the benevolent neutrality of russia toward the policy which bismarck had already in contemplation it led to the refusal of great britain to join napoleon in calling a european congress to consider the european situation at large and thus weakened at a critical moment the anglo-french entente above all it enabled bismarck to take the measure both of napoleon the third and of the whig government in england i do not desire war but neither do i desire peace thus napoleon to the french senate march seventeenth eighteen sixty three lord russell genuinely desired peace but he desired also to secure the results which only successful war could have given him neither the czar nor bismarck was a man to concede anything except to force and the final result not only constituted a decided rebuff for russell but reacted very unfavourably upon the position of england and france in regard to the danish duchies this intricate and embarrassing problem was once more brought prominently to the front by the death in eighteen sixty three of king frederick the seventh of denmark frederick was not only king of denmark but duke of schleswig holstein and lauenburg his death without heirs male raised a question as to the continuance of the personal union between the crown of denmark and the duchies a union which had subsisted since fourteen sixty the problem thus presented to denmark to germany and to europe was one of admitted complexity holstein was a german duchy inhabited by germans and held as a fief of the empire until the dissolution of the latter body eighteen o six since eighteen fifteen the duke of holstein and lauenburg had been a member of the germanic confederation 
schleswig was less exclusively german in speech and blood than holstein but according to german theory was indissolubly united to holstein this theory of indissolubility was denounced by the danes who had long been anxious for the complete incorporation of both duchies and especially schleswig to the danish monarchy such incorporation had however never been permanently accomplished and the question was further complicated by the fact that salic law survived in the duchies while the danish crown was under the lex regia of sixteen sixty five transmissible indifferently to males and females in eighteen forty eight the duchies rose in insurrection under prince frederick of augustenburg who under the salic law had strong prospective claims upon schleswig and holstein though none upon the throne of denmark but for the armed assistance of the germanic confederation and the diplomatic intervention of the powers the insurrection would unquestionably have been suppressed by the danes and the duchies would have been incorporated in the danish monarchy as it was the matter dragged on war and diplomacy taking alternate parts until a settlement was eventually reached under the leading inspiration of great britain in the treaty of london may eighth eighteen fifty two to that treaty england france austria prussia russia sweden and denmark were parties the duke of augustenburg had already march thirty first renounced for himself and his family all claims upon the duchies and had accepted four hundred thousand pounds in compensation the powers therefore recognized the right of prince christian of glucksburg to succeed to the whole of the states then united under the sceptre of the danish king basing their recognition upon the importance to european peace of the maintenance of the integrity of the danish monarchy they also affirmed that the reciprocal rights and obligations of the king of denmark and the germanic confederation were not as regards holstein and lauenburg affected by the treaty to this treaty the germanic diet was not a party several of the individual states subsequently acceded to it but others refused to do so until the views of the germanic diet were known austria and prussia were among the original signatories between eighteen fifty two and eighteen sixty three denmark made further attempts to bind the duchies closer to the crown schleswig was organically incorporated and a new constitution was imposed upon holstein without the assent of the holstein diet the incorporation of schleswig was a distinct breach of the pledge given by king frederick to austria and prussia while the holsteiners sought the support of the germanic diet against that part of the arrangement which especially affected them denmark however went on its way unheeding the british government made every effort to avert a complete rupture and in eighteen sixty two russell suggested a somewhat clumsy compromise the integrity of the danish kingdom as guaranteed by the treaty of london was to be maintained schleswig was to have the power of self-government and holstein and lauenburg were to have of course under the danish crown all that the german confederation asks for them the german powers accepted russell's suggestion as a basis for negotiation but denmark rejected it and in eighteen sixty three repudiated the compact of eighteen fifty two and by conferring autonomy upon holstein under the danish crown separated the fortunes of that duchy from those of schleswig this was a direct challenge to the german theory of indissolubility and it was at once accepted by the diet which threatened federal execution october first eighteen sixty three unless the obnoxious constitution were withdrawn before october twenty seventh russell thereupon urged denmark to suspend or withdraw the constitution but declared that great britain could not see with indifference a military occupation of holstein which is only to cease upon terms injuriously affecting the constitution of the whole danish monarchy but the control of events was already passing into hands stronger than those of lord russell bismarck had made up his mind that the acquisition of the danish duchies 
particularly the great harbour of Kiel, was essential to the future greatness of Prussia at sea. He discerned, moreover, in the complex situation, a means of forcing a quarrel upon Austria. That quarrel he believed to be unavoidable unless the interests alike of Prussia and of Germany were to be permanently sacrificed. But there were many obstacles in his path. The Danish nationalists, the guarantors of the Treaty of London, the Austrian Emperor, and the Germanic Diet. On the death of King Frederick the Seventh, November 15, 1863, Prince Christian of Glücksburg was at once proclaimed King of Denmark as Christian the Ninth. As regards the Danish kingdom, the succession was undisputed. To the duchies, the Germanic Diet immediately laid claim on behalf of Duke Frederick of Augustenburg, and on the refusal of Denmark to annul the new constitution, a body of Saxon and Hanoverian troops occupied Holstein in the name of the Diet and its candidate. This did not suit Bismarck's game. He wanted the duchies not for the Germanic Confederation, but for Prussia. In his refusal, however, to admit the claims of Duke Frederick, he was virtually alone in Germany, perhaps in Prussia. With all the cards against him, he played with consummate coolness and skill. He had already taken the measure accurately enough of the Emperor Napoleon and of the English Whigs. To Lord Russell's homilies on political morality, he was indifferent, so long as they were not backed by force, and he had good reason for his belief that Russell would not fight for Denmark. Before Austria, he dangled the red flag of the democratic revolution and persuaded her to pull the chestnuts out of the fire for him and the duchies. Upon Russia's benevolent neutrality, he could confidently count. Early in 1864, therefore, Austria and Prussia occupied Holstein as signatories of the Treaty of London and pushed aside not only the Danish nationalists, but the Germanic Diet and their candidate. End of Section 33